Hi, I'm J. John. Welcome to J. John on Sundays at God TV. I really do hope that you've enjoyed these last few months, particularly during lockdown. My wife, Killy and I, we've certainly had a lot of fun. We've been experimenting, filming in our lounge, in our front room, in our kitchen, and we've had all sorts of uh, hindrances that we've had to overcome, but with it came a lot of laughter as we tried to preach and teach, and then an aeroplane goes by, or the neighbor decides to cut a tree down. But I have to say the most humorous or the funniest moment was when I was teaching a particular sermon. And as I was doing that, Alexa, who we had not switched off, came on and Alexa said, I don't understand what you are saying. My wife, Killy and I just bursted out laughing. Uh, I, I wish we'd captured the whole thing and uh, broadcast it to you. But anyway, we've had a lot of fun recording and we hope that you have enjoyed all of the teaching. Well, we've now converted my office into a studio and we tried to make it feel homely. And so we're now transitioning into a new series for J. John on Sundays with Facing the Canon. I am a canon in the Church of England. I have a seat in Coventry Cathedral. And the title canon is, is something that's given. And it was given to me uh, as an accreditation, as a form of authority uh, to minister and preach and to teach. And I'm encouraged to be an example. And I hope and pray that I have been an example as I've been teaching and preaching. Well, this new series, Facing the Canon, is an opportunity for me to dialogue with all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds about their journey of faith, about their calling upon their lives, about the issues that they are engaging with and I know from the list of guests that we've got in these weeks ahead, I know that you will find it very inspiring, very encouraging, very equipping and very motivating. So thank you for joining us on J. John on Sundays on God TV. Welcome to Facing the Canon. Welcome, Ben John, to Facing the Canon. It's great to be here with you. I, it's del I'm delighted to have you in our new studio yeah, for wonderful. this new uh, Facing the Canon series. Now, you work, Ben, for Christian Concern. Tell us, who are Christian Concern? Uh, so Christian Concern are a advocacy um, campaigning organisation seeking to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ in, in public life. And, so our public life is kind of three key areas for us, uh, law, media um, and government. So law, for example, would be uh, legal cases for Christians in the UK who are maybe being marginalised for expressing um, their belief. Um, media, for example, is, is going on to the media and, and really making a case for um, the historic Christian Orthodox positions on various key issues facing Christians today. Um, so, you know, that could be the BBC, Sky News, LBC Radio. Um, all those different areas uh, and government for example is 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 about mobilizing christians to respond to the challenges that we're facing with our politicians or our government um, whatever that is uh, and really um, sometimes challenging um, government decisions government policies government legislation um, all through a lens of jesus christ now give us some examples ben of the of the type of clients that you have represented over the years yeah, so in our legal side, um, so we have it within Christian Concern, we have the Christian Legal Centre, um, which provides legal support to Christians, um, oftentimes who've um, been disciplined or have lost their jobs uh, because of expressing particular views related to um, the Christian faith or Christian orthodoxy or 
uh, morals. So one of our big cases in the last few years has been a gentleman named Felix Ngole. He was a master's student at the University of Sheffield doing social work. He um, expressed his view on his Facebook page that marriage was between a man and a woman um, and on various discussion boards. Um, so he expressed the view that marriage was between a man and a woman and, and this a complaint was registered with the university because of this. And he was deemed not to be fit to be a social worker because of the view, his view, that marriage was between a man and a woman because they were saying, um, yeah, he wasn't fit to be a social worker. So we challenged that. So he was removed from the course. Yeah. Soldier was not fit to be a social worker. And we challenged that decision uh, in court. And last, uh, in, uh, and then we ended up winning that case yes. on appeal. So, um, yeah, so we initially lost the case, we appealed it, and then we won the case, uh, meaning that he was able, um, yeah, so he was able to go back. And so um, that was quite encouraging for us. And it was interesting because oftentimes, and, and this does happen, is people sometimes get into trouble because they say things badly or poorly or, you know, or whatever in an unwise manner. You know, we would still defend the right to say things in an unwise manner. Um, but in this case, the University of Sheffield in court argued that it wasn't how he said it, that it was the mere expression, the mere holding of the views was enough to say that he wasn't fit to be a social worker. And so the principle that we were really fighting for there yes. was hugely important because it's kind of saying, well, are there, are there certain views that are just unaccept unacceptable in certain lines of work? You know, because he was saying, well, he would be discriminatory, even though... Um, he had so many references from clients from his placements at Social Work showing how he served everybody equally and that he was impartial, um, you know, which we're called to be as Christians. Um, so that's one of, our, one of the big cases and we're, we're but I thankful mean, to God. But that, Ben, you know, there are some people who actually believe we shouldn't even express a particular conviction yeah. um, in a democracy. Yeah. There are people who believe that. Yeah. And it's a, uh, well, it's a sad sort of state that we're in because I think we're, we're trying to push the, we're trying to, or not even push, we're trying to draw new lines on what freedom of speech means or what's acceptable. And I think it's tied in generally with the culture. You know, the, the, the Overton window has shifted and moved so fast. And that's part of what we're wanting to do is slow down and God willing change the direction because there are things now which 10 years ago, or even five years ago, um, were wholly uncontroversial, but today can get you cancelled. You know, whether that's something like transgenderism, for example, expressing the view that um, uh, we're born male and female, can get you into so much trouble. I mean, one of our cases, um, uh, Dr. David Makareth, he said that he believed that we're born male and female and that we cannot change that, that we cannot transition um, in his, um, he was, and he was sacked from his job for saying that. Now you yourself, you're involved in the Wilberforce Academy that's part of Christian Concern. Tell us about that. So the Wilberforce Academy is more on our training side and trying to think about, well, what can we be doing to change the tide, uh, change the current, um, in the culture and in society. And so the Wilberforce Academy um, is, a, is a leadership program for young Christian students, young professionals, about equipping and engaging them to understand the key issues facing Christians today and how we can respond and how we can be bold in speaking um, into these areas, but also about thinking about what are we called to do as Christians in society? And what does it mean for the Christian faith to be represented in law, politics, art, healthcare, business, um, all of these different areas? Is it just about being a Christian in the workplace or is it about yeah. transforming these areas, these spheres, to the glory of God. So basically having a biblical understanding yes. and a biblical world view. Yes. Of all of life. Of all of life. Yes. My life, family life, yes. my calling in life, my ministry, my leisure. Yes. Yeah. Why why is it, Ben, do you think when we don't have 
a global biblical worldview? Uh, have we not been taught well? So I think in the last few generations, and maybe part of this is kind of post-enlightenment, we've created this sacred secular divide. And although today we're a little bit better at saying that we don't believe in a sacred secular divide, I think we, we haven't taken it to its fullness about the full application, the full discipleship of life. And so because of the sacred secular divide, we've restricted and privatized our faith, thinking our faith only matters to me and that um, the faith has no application to the rest of life and to the rest of the world. And, and it, you know, it, this real world is for the place of facts, for the place of nature, um, the place of things that you can see. And then the spiritual realm is, is, is oh, that's quite spiritual. That's what my faith, that's where my faith is. We, we've created this false divide thinking um, that that's, you know, that's what witnesses. And that, you yes. know, we, we kind of think, okay, well, we should only do soul winning and we shouldn't do any other yeah. form of discipleship. And so in terms of talking about culture, the church over the last hundred years has oftentimes just, kind of let culture do its own thing without really thinking, well, what do we think about this? How should we interpret these things? And what we're seeing now in society really is just the fruit of the last hundred years of cultural change, even longer. So, look, Ben, we've got the church, Mm. we've got the world, okay? And uh, we want to be able to communicate truth to the world, don't we? Yeah. But sadly, so much of the church uh, is what we may call liberal today on a lot of these issues. So we're struggling even with our own church. So what's your take on that? I think there's a few things. I think there's been a lack of um, real biblical teaching on the issues and understanding worldview. How, what is the Christian understanding on marriage? What is the Christian understanding about the sanctity of the unborn child? Because we have a generation of people who haven't been taught that, they're now a generation of parents who are raising children who, uh, and they're now discipling their children in these ways as well. Um, I think that's another area as well in in the area of just discipleship of youth as well. Um, I don't think we've particularly discipled children particularly well. Um, And I think particularly in the, we've outsourced that maybe to the church and, the, and, the, and youth are just being discipled really by the world. You know, when you send a child to schools that are explicitly almost catechizing them in, in a secular pagan worldview, what do we kind of expect? You know, when yeah. they're there for six hours a day, a day and yeah. then they're, well, okay, they have an hour and a half at church on a Sunday and maybe, you know, an hour and a half midweek one evening. Yes. You know, we need to be spending and investing so much more in our youth to raise them up in the way they should go so that when they're old, they will not um, depart from it. I think another thing is... So what advice would you give church leaders then, Ben? On just generally on the issue. Generally on the, you know, what they should be doing for their flock as the pastors. What advice would you give? You should be looking to be clear on the issues so that... That having clarity on the issues frees you up to do more evangelism. Yes. We, we oftentimes have got it twisted a bit where we think, okay, we shouldn't talk about any of these things because we're afraid that it will harm evangelism. The point is, is when you have clarity and you're, you're clear, like, this is what we're offering. This is what the faith is and means. You, you're liberated to go and preach the gospel. Yes. Um, so I'd say, and that includes in your normal preaching these issues should come up they come up in scripture so they should come up in our preaching you know if we're preaching through the bible um yeah, these you can't, issues should you can't come avoid up. them no exactly i know so as in if you're avoid if you're not preaching on them it you know it kind of means well and it doesn't mean you know you have to go on about homosexuality every yeah. single week but it just means as and when it comes up preach on it i know and be bold it's true well i I, think, I i follow and i know you do as well uh, the Robin, Robert Murray McShane Bible Reading Plan, yeah. and which makes you read through the whole Bible in a year. Yeah. And you can't avoid these issues. Yeah. Uh, and the danger of picking and choosing your favourite passages yes. is that you miss 
yes. everything else that God is saying. Yes. And he's saying it very loud and clear, isn't he, yes. in scripture? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so absolutely. So we need to be able to, and that includes encouraging Christians to be reading their Bibles themselves. Yeah. Because I think a lot of Christians maybe don't have a daily Bible reading plan. So they don't see these verses, you know, they kind of take the, the more inspiring, they have, you know, they'll have an inspiring verse for the day. And then they don't really tackle with some of the other passages in scripture. Another thing I would encourage church leaders yes. to do is to be practicing church discipline. And when you don't, when you're not practicing church discipline, in whatever form that kind of looks like, um, that's what will eventually lead to liberalism in the church. When you are, when you're allowing a unrepentant, um, whatever type of sinner, you know, yes. let's say thief, if you're allowing an unrepentant thief yes. to, um, uh, take communion in your church. The next thing you know, they're in a they're, yeah, they're, or, or, they're, or an adulterer. Yes, and yes, it's, an and adulterer. it's obvious. Yes, or yes. fornicator or an adulterer. Yeah. If you take an unrepentant adulterer, and you're allowing them to take holy communion, and Paul is quite clear that about that in First yes. Corinthians, um, the next thing you know, they're serving in the church. Yeah, they're a the, home group. The leader. next thing you know, home group leader. The next thing you know they are preaching on a Sunday. The and next the next thing you know, thing you know they go and get ordained. Exactly. Yes. And so we need to be better at practicing church discipline yes. in the church. And the thing is, the aim and the goal of church discipline is restoration. Of course. Do you mean? It's yeah, not because power. we believe in redemption. Yes. Elders are not to lord no. over their flock. The point is we want restoration. We want reconciliation. And, you know, I think oftentimes maybe we, the church has downplayed holiness because of the emphasis on grace you yes. know and we maybe have un misunderstood the relationship between the law law and gospel law and grace yes uh, we're called to holiness you know and so we we should i think it was martin luther said you know the christian life is marked by repentance absolutely and so we we should be preaching that as well and you know not works not works righteousness not legalism but it's about holiness and we have joy in that you know read psalm 119 yeah it's there yeah Ben, if you had to highlight, um, you know, in bullet points, right, what are the issues that are facing Christians today? Mm. What are those issues? Well, you could have a big backdrop to what they all are. Okay. Um, a kind of, you know, I think a lot of this is to deal with the secular liberalism. I think there's a revival of kind of paganism um, and that's manifesting itself in different ways. Ultimately, it's a culture of death. And so... Today, I'd say some of the... And, and the culture of death, just clarify that. What do you mean by that? So the issues are identified by the fact that it's, it's pursuing death. Okay. Yeah. Or it's not a culture of life. Yes, it's not yeah. pursuing Christians life. Christians is about... Our faith is about abundant life. Our faith is about human flourishing. Yes. When we live in accordance with God's ways, we flourish. You know, that's what flourish, you know, that's what true, to be truly human means to be in Christ. Yes. Um, and so what we're seeing now is, well, we're outside of Christ and we're on this path of destruction. So there's different ways we could say that in terms of medical ethics, for example, abortion is about death because it's about yes. the killing of unborn children. Yes. We're seeing a renewed effort in the push for assisted suicide. Yes. Um, which I think we're going to see over the next few years, this increased push, more MPs are coming out in support of, of assisted suicide. Again, it's a culture of death. Um, we often say that the, the generation that killed their children will be killed by their children. Um, and that t applies, uh, ties in with a wider demographic problem. Because in the West, particularly, we haven't been having enough children, we're going to be entering into a population crisis in the next 50, 60 years, but there's not going to be enough working age children to look after the elderly because we, the average number of children has been less than two, which is less than the replacement rate. So we're going to have this push for, I think there's going to be a renewed pressure on euthanasia, assisted suicide. And the number one reason for assisted suicide given in Canada, I think, was loneliness or feeling, sorry, was um, feeling like a burden. Oh, a burden. Burden, burden to their family. Yeah, to society, to their families. And um, loneliness was up there as well. Uh, yes. Um, so those are medical ethics. I think on top of that, um, there's issues of the redefinition of the family and a redefinition of identity. So we're seeing that in homosexuality. We're seeing that in transgenderism. Um, and about what are we defining our lives on? Who are we? 
And the world is saying, if you experience a certain temptation, you're not truly flourishing, you're not truly being who you are, unless you act out and live out that lifestyle. Whereas the, for Christians, when we're in Christ, when we're redeemed, when we're washed, yes. we're sanctified, we're not defined by our temptations anymore. No. You know, of course, we still have that battle. The point is, is that I don't have that identity. We don't live according to that yeah. identity. And as the scripture says, we, uh, we have a high priest yes. who understands, who enables us not to follow yes. these desires. Yes, exactly. Um, I think that signals a wider problem that we have in society. And that, sadly, in the churches, we don't understand what marriage is and for. Yes. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying we go the uh, kind of necessarily a, a Roman no. Catholic route, but as in marriage is for procreation. And I think we have misunderstood that. And I think part of that has become an overly romantic view of, of marriage, where it's based entirely on feelings. Yes. And that's why I think maybe divorce is much higher than it is, because it's you fall in, in love, but when you fall out of love, it's over. Sure. Whew. You can be very overwhelmed by a lot to, that's happening in the world, but of course we need to open our eyes yes. and ears. Um, but in the midst of all of that, uh, the Lord still reigns. Yes. The Lord is still on his throne. Um, I, I, do you, are you an optimist? Are you encouraged? Do you feel uh, renewal, repentance, revivals coming? Um, so I think, I mean, we've got to always remember God is sovereign. Absolutely. And he can do what he wants. Yes. And so in that sense, I'm optimistic because I know God's in control. Yes. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm, I think revivals round the corner. Um, I think it's going to get harder and tougher for Christians in the next generation or so. And we may well be entering into a season of persecution. But um, I think that would have a pruning effect on the church. I think we would, we, I think we would see a purifying, purifying church. the church. And that, is a, you know, that would be a good thing. I don't think we should romanticise persecution and romanticise being uh, marginalised. I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to be marginalised. Um, but I think that's what's going to happen. I think it's going to become increasingly difficult. And the next few steps might be things like if you're Orthodox, you can't be a charity. Um, yes. You know, statements of faith that you need to subscribe to be able to do certain things, you know, like the Felix and Gole case. That might be it. There might be a renewed effort to do things like that. Um, but long term, of course, I'm optimistic. Yes. I think um, Christ has the victory. I think he is victorious. He is winning. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that he is currently making uh, a footstool out of all his enemies and he won't return until um, he's defeated the final enemy, which yes. is death. So yes. he's defeating all the enemies. So we just need to trust God, be empowered by his Holy Spirit and be faithful in our gospel ministry. Definitely. Now, you, Christian Concern, Ben, you, you produce a lot of uh, resources and materials to educate the church equip the church yeah. just mention some of those resources yeah so you yeah, know our heart is really to serve the church and to equip um, churches uh, pastors lay people um, to be able to speak and engage on these issues so Wilberforce Academy is probably our biggest training program um, we also do a number of different events we have um, gospel issues seminars which look at particular issues that are available online on our YouTube page um, and on our website and then we do produce um, um, yeah, resources, written work. So under the banner of Wilberforce Publications, we publish books, um, uh, resources, booklets, again, dealing with the different issues and also helping Christians understand and have a Christian worldview. Um, so Joe Boot, for example, you, yes, um, you know, we know um, well. he's our head of public theology. So we've published yes. a number of his books, one of which is The Mission of God, which is really about what is our role in society as Christians? What is the role of, what's the mission of God? Um, throughout all of society and culture, making the case that, you know, cultural engagement is a part and a task sure. for Christians. Um, and thinking about well, what does that then look like um, there? We also do uh, publish books like, um, uh, you know, what are they teaching the children? Yes. Um, which is equipping parents to understand about, you know, what are the challenges in education these days um, and issues like that. Great. Um, so, yeah. Plenty of resources that are available yeah. uh, to help equip and uh, educate the church. What, what would your prayer requests be, knowing what you know 
uh, about the world and about society. What should we be praying for, Ben? I think um, the key thing we should be praying for is faithfulness um, today. I think we, we're entering into a tough time and I think we need to know what faithfulness is. And I think that's a kind of an umbrella term for lots of different things. But I think when things are getting tough, it's about serving God. When, it, when it's about having a fear of God, not a fear of man. Um, it's about withstanding the opposition and the criticism. It's about loving our enemy. It's about speaking the truth in love, um, even when it's hard. Knowing that with all the times that we mess up, God is still faithful. Yes. What does that then look like for us when we try and speak and be bold and point people towards Christ? And Because that's what it's about. You know, when we engage on these things, our heart should always be, we want you to know Christ. It's not about winning an argument or any of these things. And it's about being a witness for Jesus Christ, being faithful to him in all of these things. You know, I don't really enjoy going on um, BBC radio to talk about abortion, you know, but it's about me trying to be faithful, trying to serve God in that area. You know, and we don't always get it right. But God is gracious. So, yeah, I suppose the challenge for us Christians is to be faithful yeah. and uh, persevering yes. uh, and not to give up. Yeah. Well, so if people want to know more about Christian Concern, your website, Ben, is... www.christianconcern.com. Uh, yeah, and you can find out more about the Wilberforce Academy at wilberforceacademy.org.uk. Ben, it's great to have you on Facing the Canon. Thank, thank you for thank joining you for us. Having, thank you for having me. Well, lots of issues that have been raised and uh, it is a challenge, isn't it, for those of us that are Christians? You know, what, what do we do about these issues? What do we do uh, about these battles that we face and uh, the challenges um, to our beliefs? Um, and how do we behave uh, both in the church uh, and in the world today? You know, I, I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than stand with the world and be judged by God. And we need to make a stand. We need to make a stand on truth. And the great thing, as Jesus Christ said, when you know the truth, when you experience the truth, the truth is absolutely liberating. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. I hope you've been inspired. Thank you.